Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast. This week in the current events section of The Plodcast, Doug makes clear the devastating news that education matters. As it turns out, Americans have been subsidizing the radicalization of its children in higher education for decades. As we look around and see private businesses on fire and bricks flying through windows, we see that the loaf has been plenty leavened with unbelief. So if you or someone you know has a recently graduated senior looking for an open campus this fall, without masks or riots, apply to New St. Andrews College at nsa.edu slash fall2020. Come to New St. Andrews College in person this fall and learn to inherit, appreciate, and critique your history like adults. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 147, 147. A number of you have been um, musing about the uh, meaning or the import of the fact that many of America's young people are out in the streets throwing bricks through windows, and you don't discern, you can't discern any particular reason for them doing that. If you have people looting a Walmart and running off with the goods, uh, you disapprove of it, but at least you understand why someone would want to grab a pair of sneakers or, or grab some food. It's not a nonsensical action. It's a sinful action, but not a nonsensical one. Uh, and then you look at uh, pampered and privileged kids, uh, middle class, upper middle class kids, who, who despise the country they grew up in and want to see it burn. The question comes to your mind, where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? Well. The short answer is that uh, the 1960s radicals uh, who wanted to see it all burn, after, the, uh, after that brief abortive tumultuous time called the 60s, uh, they went on to grad school. They uh, went on living their privileged existence, and a number of them got their PhDs in, in uh, various kinds of studies and whatnot, and burrowed into the woodwork of the academy. The world of higher education is chock full of socialists, leftists, feminists, egalitarians. And as it turns out, education matters. Education matters. Not only does it matter, but even in the world of Christian higher ed, uh, because uh, a lot of these colleges are, these Christian colleges, have to uh, maintain accreditation standards. They have, to, um, they have to hire PhDs, and the PhDs that they want to hire are going to be people who were educated at various, um, in various ungodly places. And so uh, Christian colleges are frequently as disordered and as bad as the secular colleges uh, for corrupting young people. Because when a kid goes off to Behemoth State U, and he's a pious um, high school graduate. He loves the Lord. He goes off to the secular university knowing that he has to keep his guard up. But many times when they go off to the Christian college, they think, oh, it's all Christian. It's all good. And they don't have their guard up. And sometimes you have a better chance of having your kid graduate from a college like Wheaton as a leftist or a feminist or someone who is bought into the this all this wokery, wokery stuff um, than you do if they had gone to a secular school. Now, one of the, if if we want to stop the radicalism in our streets, we have to we have to cut it off at the source. We have to cut it off at the source, and cutting it off at the source means that we have to uh, develop a a dark uh, view of the value of secular education. The fact that your great-grandfather went to Ole Miss uh, and got a fine education uh, doesn't mean that that's what they're doing there now. 
the fact that uh, when you were a college student and you uh, got your engineering degree or your forestry, forestry uh, degree, that doesn't mean that the same thing is happening now. And so we have to revisit the whole thing. This is an illustration I came up with when, um, <laughs> when Blockbuster was still a thing. Um, so it, the technology, the, just work with me on the illustration. Back in the day when you would get a VHS tape and you were watching a movie, if you're watching the movie and it turns out to be a stinker of a movie, you don't rewind it and try again. You're going to get the same movie. You're going to get the same result again. So if, if someone said, who radicalized America's young people? Who radicalized them? The answer is found in higher education. From their freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior years at college, that's where, all, uh, that's where these kids were radicalized. Not only so, but uh, America's chump middle class, by means of the taxes they pay and the tuition they pay and, the, and all of that, we paid for our kids to, get, um, to take radicalism lessons. We paid for them to do this to us, and then we lament and pull at our pull at our uh, wrench at our head and say, "How could this? How could this be happening? Uh, what is happening to America?" Well, basically, we have to realize um, we are what's happening to America. Uh, this is something we are doing. Basically, um, if I could uh, insert a plug here. New St. Andrews College, uh, founded in the 90s, has not taken one thin dime of government money since in, in a, our entire uh, period of existence. And the reason we didn't do that, the reason we didn't uh, become dependent upon government generosity is we knew that days like this were going to be coming. We wanted to keep our independence. We wanted to be uh, not uh, governed by this, the SCOTUS ruling, the Title VII ruling about uh, gays and lesbians and so on. Uh, but Christian colleges that have budgets that are dependent on government money, uh, they're going to have, th th this is nine miles of bad road. Always a will be Podcast episode 147. Uh, this is our hamartiology section. Our word this time around is authenteo, authenteo, A-U-T-H-E-N-T-E-O. The word describes someone who kicks at legitimate authority. They kick at legitimate authority, trying to usurp it. And what authority is more legitimate, more natural, than the authority of a husband over a wife? And while the duty of direct submission is a duty that a wife owes to her husband only, in other words, a wife submits to her husband, it's not any given woman submitting to any given man. The fact that every wife is to be submissive to her own husband, this basic authority structure in the home, it does have implications for broader gatherings, including the church. And this is why Paul gives us this requirement, 1 Timothy 2.12. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. There's that authenteo. That, that's the word there, to usurp authority but to be in silence. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. This is the one time in the New Testament that this word is used, and from the context we see that when women take charge in the leadership of the church, then things are deeply disordered. There are two things prohibited to women here. One is a teaching role in the church generally. Uh, women are not prohibited from teaching women, the older in Titus, the older women are to teach the younger women and, and so on. Uh, so it's not that women can't teach. And it's not that a husband and wife can't be discussing something in their living room and have her say something uh, that he learns from. Uh, but Paul is talking about a teaching role, a formal teaching role in the church. That is flat prohibited. So that um, a woman must not get up in the pulpit and... Um, look out over a congregation of men and women uh, both and say, hear the word of God, ye sinners. Th that is not uh, something that a woman is called to do. So that's the first thing that's prohibited. The second 
is uh, she is barred from having a position of rule in the church. This means that women are not to be ministers of the word, and women are not to be ruling elders. Women are not to be ministers of the word, and they are not to be ruling elders. Now, this sentiment may not be, uh, this sentiment may be unpopular in most circles, and it may be illegal in others, but there it is, right in the Bible. So we come now to our book review section. Back in the 80s, I profited a great deal uh, reading uh, some of the um, early works of uh, Rusas Rushduni, R.J. Rushduni. Books like uh, The Nature of the American System and uh, uh, Foundations of Social Order. And uh, I think I read Intellectual Schizophrenia. I think I read that one. Um, uh, the Politics of Guilt and Pity. And of course, I read the Institutes of Biblical Law, the first, the first volume. And uh, recently, I thought uh, I, I forget what provoked me. I thought I, I would go back and read one of his books from that era that I had not yet read. And the one I picked was the Mythology of Science, the Mythology of Science, by Rush Dooney. It's a very valuable work. One of the things that Rush Dooney does here, I've I've read a lot of uh, creationist material. And Rush Dooney is a young earth creationist, and he's a staunch young earth creationist. But his, his interest in this book, uh, the, the characteristic of his interest, his theological interest overall, is not so much in scientific evidences. He's not, a, he's not a trained scientist, and he doesn't really go into that at all. He's dealing with the issue uh, theologically slash philosophically. And he shows, demonstrates, that modern scientists are trying to play God. The denial of special creation, the way God said that he did it. If someone says, no, the, I know the Bible says that God created the world 6,000 years ago, and that's, uh, that's unbelievable. We should respond, well, yes, that's why we call you an unbeliever. Uh, <laughs> You don't think it's believable. No, no, someone might say, there are many believers who don't believe. But let me stop you right there. There are many believers who don't believe. Don't believe what? Don't believe what the Bible says. Well, what Rush Dooney is so good at doing is showing the foundational presuppositions that everybody has going into a discussion like this. Uh, the denial of God, according to Rush Dooney, the denial of God by anyone, any finite creature, whether he is a philosopher or he's doing philosophy of science or he's a practicing scientist, any denial of God is so that the person denying God may attempt to take his place. The denial of God is an attempt to be God. A denial of God is trying to create a job opening. And it's very clear, he, uh, Rush Dooney in this book has some astonishing quotes from scientists about what they think they're going to be able to do. Uh, they really are aspiring to the position of deity. And this is a mythology. It's not a revealed religion. It's not, it's not a revealed faith from the true God. This is a mythological religious faith commitment. And it's decked out with esoteric jargon. It's decked out with uh, uh, language that's hard for the layman to follow, so that people can say, "Well, you don't, you know, you're not a trained scientist. Stand back. You're not a trained scientist." If you are at all interested in the question of origins, and I think you ought to be, and if you have a theological turn of mind, this is not a big book. I maybe 150 pages. I, I didn't look at it before I. Uh, came here, but it's it's not a, a whacking great big book, but it really is um, densely packed, well worth well worth the read. Mm -hmm.